Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Human-Centered Design, Constructing Library Resources for the Real-World Needs of Faculty and Students, which is sponsored by ProQuest. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, the structured 60-minute uh, live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. And before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you may see a Q&A panel um, or a chat panel. If you don't see the chat, you can click the little button that is sort of looking like a dialogue cloud in the middle bottom part of your screen, and that should open it up for you. Um, please use the Q&A panel to submit questions to our speakers. We'll hold those questions to the end of the presentation. Um, so when you have a question, please do take a minute uh, to let us know, and we'll answer as many as we have time for. If you experience any technical issues, please use the chat panel to let me know, and I'll use that to troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Today, we're using the hashtag ACRL Choice Webinars during the event, so if you have another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Also note that we are recording today's program, and everyone who re registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archived version. All right. Our speaker today is uh, Bree Pegum of ProQuest, and with that, we are ready to get started. So I will pass the ball over to you, Bree. Thanks, Mark, and good morning, afternoon, everyone joining us. I uh, really appreciate you coming to the webinar today. I'm very excited to talk to you a little bit about my world in ProQuest One Academic and, and really kind of talk about the life of a, a product manager and, and what keeps us, keeps us up at night. So just as a reminder for the session that you signed up for, <laughs> just to manage expectations for today, um, I do want to take you through a journey of you know, how we're reinventing the linear databases of the past into a more interactive and immersive research and learning experience going forward. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about the challenges faced by faculty, students, and librarians, a little bit about the origins of how we came up with ProQuest One Academic, and then give you a bit of a behind the scenes on what you might expect in the months ahead. So as Mark said, my name is Bree Pegum. Um, I'm also getting used to my last name, so I still uh, use that sometimes, so that also, I respond to that. Um, I lead Product and Marketing Strategy within ProQuest Information Solutions Unit. I'm based in Cambridge in England. Uh, in the background there, you'll see uh, the river cam that runs through our lovely city. That's the bridge I actually take to work. Um, and I'm responsible for enabling customer discovery and developing digital products. I've been in product management for many years now, and I really find it's a, a great way to interact with users, understand their problems, and come up with solutions. Uh, my background is in environmental science, and I did my MBA uh, a couple of years ago, so I uh, have a good kind of mixture of interdisciplinary research in my background, which is why I've ended up where I did. So a little bit about product management and, you know, about problem solving. You know, it's a very interesting role, and, you know, we all in our daily lives kind of do mini product management and we think about, you know, we interact with different software, we interact with different uh, tools and apps on our phones, uh, we might order delivery to show up on a scooter, we might walk and, and quit use our phone to check out a scooter in a city while we're, we're traveling, um, but we're, we're surrounded all day long by all sorts of innovations that promise to improve our lives. Uh, and this is a really exciting way to, to think about, you know, what are the opportunities to make things a little bit easier for folks. And within the realm that we work in at ProQuest, it's really about how we can make things more meaningful for research, teaching, and learning. And we all know that the academic research space is changing immensely. Um, the volume of content that's available can be quite overwhelming to students and faculty. The speed at which uh, information is being published, the formats in which it's being shared, um, all creating a lot of change in the research space. And so we do a lot of research at ProQuest ourselves to try to understand how to get out in front of that change and how to best manage it so that you as librarians can help your end users. And one of the recent pieces of research we did 
was really trying to understand uh, this kind of critical mass of content that's available and what is the future of uh, demand for different content types. And so last year in 2018, in the spring, we ran a survey of about 1,300 faculty and students from across the world, and we asked them what kind of content types they work with, and certainly tried to look for differences between uh, perhaps what faculty are using, and then what they're actually recommending in the classroom, and then if those recommend recommendations are being heeded by the students that they work with. Uh, and what we found is that, by and large, students and faculty are using and relying upon the same materials for their research projects. Faculty tend to prefer scholarly journals, but only slightly to students. Um, faculty also rely heavily on books. They seem to prefer print and tend to recommend print, uh, whereas students have a, a stronger preference for electronic books. But Again, across the board, you see a similarity in the variety of content types that are being used and recommended. Um, and that really speaks to the breadth of materials that are required for different stages of the research process. So having access to all of this content and, and wanting to, to work with all this content, you know, what, what's the benefit? What's the, what, why does it matter to, to our students and to our faculty? Um, and so as part of the same research, we asked them, you know, what they thought the very content could offer to, to student success. Uh, and so the faculty responded across an, a variety of statements. And they were thinking that, you know, not only will having access to a variety of content help students get better grades on the courses, which is certainly a short-term uh, success, um, but also that they would, in general, produce better quality assignments. So that's obviously uh, important for the students, but it does make the faculty's life a little bit easier when it comes to grading. Um, when it comes to more liter um, thorough literature reviews, the faculty were even more convinced that varied content means that students can look at con uh, their research topics from a variety of angles. But probably the most important and the most critical statement here is that 96% of faculty agreed that uh, having access to varied content would help their students understand concepts and ideas more fully. So that kind of highest benefit of having this access is really being able to grasp and to, to work with uh, complex topics. And that's where looking at it through the lens of a newspaper article, as well as some journal articles and watching a video and getting immersed in a book chapter really helps them understand the concepts and, and create their own novel contributions to that area. So by and large, they, the faculty said that it's really important for students to, to seek out the variety of viewpoints, often published in different formats, they can draw their own conclusions and build critical thinking skills. And that seems to be the underlying current in a lot of the research that we've come across this year as well, is that you know, it's not just about variety for variety's sake and just because it's out there means it's important. We know that not everything that um, is published or is, is available digitally is, is reliable, um, but certainly there's plenty of scholarly resources across a variety of formats that will help students really challenge the way they think and really come up with novel, uh, novel ways of thinking and approaching a topic. So this is where ProCuff really steps in and, and tries to figure out how we can help um, make this transition a bit easier. If we know that academic research is changing and we know that students and faculty are relying on an increasing variety of content types, what can we do to make that a bit more seamless? So that's what we think about um, within ProQuest and our product management group. And one of the first things that we did was we attempted to integrate all of the content onto a single platform. And we're well on our way now of moving away from the content database silos that were all on different websites and required all sorts of different credentials to be logged in um, and made users you know, look just at newspaper articles or look just at the journal articles. And, and we've understood that having access to the content side by side and moving dynamically through and cross-searching that variety of content really adds a lot of value and it cuts out many steps and, and a lot of complication in the process of looking for relevant information for a particular research topic. So pulling it onto the, all onto the same platform was kind of the first step that we took. The second step was then to integrate the search into a single starting point. Um, a lot of our customers also benefit from discovery solutions that they've implemented at their institution, and we've tried to take some of the best uh, of that idea to say, you know, users really want something quite simple, something quite friendly, um, unintimidating. A lot of our users are undergraduates, 
and they're used to a Google type search box. And so we want to present both simplicity, but also show them the robustness of what's available. So this is where you're allowed to run a search term across all of the resources that you're um, that the library subscribes to, the end user can also choose to select just a particular format, run an advanced search, um, get some help on search topics and how to, to work with bibliographies, um, but it's really an unintimidating uh, starting point and that's really, really important. And then what we've done with the ProQuest content is we've integrated it into a single filterable list. Again, we've pulled all those different formats together that we know that the students and faculty rely upon. And we've said, let's, let's start here, and you can go through all those resources as a, as a jumping off point, and you can filter down to just the ones that are peer reviewed or perhaps just uh, published within the last couple of years. Often that's a requirement on assignment to, to narrow down the window, um, but really showing them the breadth of information that would be available to research on their topic. And what's really important here is that because we pulled everything together on a single platform, we can really invest in making the at item experience as amazing as possible. We can make sure that if you're interacting with a journal article, it's the best in class experience. If you're interacting with an ebook, you've got the best in class e reader uh, experience that allows you to mark up the text or annotate or, or um, uh, basically uh, highlight different parts of the text. Um, similarly, our video viewer is, is world class and allows you to have a really engaging and immersive experience. So that's really the benefit of, of having everything in one place and being able to move laterally through the content uh, means that we can really provide a, a fantastic experience once they reach, reach the piece of uh, information that they're looking for. So having made those changes to the, the ProQuest platform, in January of this year, we launched a new collection called ProQuest One Academic. And if you aren't familiar with ProQuest One Academic, it is the world's largest collection of academic content and it is comprised of our four multidisciplinary databases of ProQuest Central, Academic Complete, ProQuest Dissertations and Theses Global, and Avon. So these really are four flagship uh, multidisciplinary collections, and as I said, we, we understand that students and faculty are, are very keen to work across a variety of resources depending on what stage of research they're at. Um, if they're quite new to a topic, a video can be a very nice introduction, can be a very engaging and immersive experience, particularly for students. If they're starting to familiarize themselves a little bit more, they might want something comprehensive in the form of a book chapter, and then they're looking at the kind of the limits of the research and seeing what the, the scholars have published in academic journals, which come from ProQuest Central, and really seeing what um, graduate works are coming out of institutions, what really is the frontier of, of a research topic, and that's really found in the dissertations and theses. So again, depending on if they're formulating their idea or they're looking for collaborators, or they're looking for methodology, all of those uh, pieces can, can really give that holistic picture that we know is so important to helping students and faculty really comprehend uh, a topic. And overall, ProQuest One Academic is really about providing a benefit to your entire academic community. Uh, we know that the content is really important for the students and faculty. We cover over 175 subject areas. Uh, which is over 21,000 periodical titles, 66,000 videos, over 200,000 dissertations and theses, and over 150,000 ebooks, in addition to the news resources. And pulling that content together on a unified platform and being able to cross search that information really makes it very easy for the, the students and faculty to work with it. Again, it works really well with discovery solutions. Uh, and that's really where we, we know that you're pointing your uh, students and faculty if you have one implemented, uh, and then they can come right in and, and reach that, that best in class experience at the document or video uh, level. And really what we're trying to do is, is make your lives easier um, by having smooth integration with discovery solutions, by having content that's available for, for, to meet the needs of your very diverse communities, and to really reduce a lot of the headaches that can come from managing multiple platforms, having to support them, having to do training on them, having to do marketing on them, um, having kind of a single consistent unified experience every time they reach a piece of content um, really can, can kind of reduce a lot of stress and help make the research process a lot smoother. I think we have over 650 million items in ProQuest One Academic um, so the more consistent that experience can be, uh, 
um, that there's a similar look and feel and a similar navigation means that researchers can get on to the problem solving faster and spend less time trying to understand and navigate different types of databases. And since we launched in uh, January of this year, we have unified the search as I showed you, and I did mention the interactive e-reader and providing context to, to news. We're really looking across all of the formats that are so critical to the research community and trying to understand what's going to make that content really pop, what's going to make it a really dynamic experience that they can quickly get to the insights and, and move on to the next stage of their research. And as of uh, June of this year, as of last month, we launched at ALA virtual reality video. We were the first um, provider to add academic video in 360 to the platform. This can be viewed, you know, just in a browser window, just going through and doing uh, mousing around to get the 360. You can go all the way up to the, the really uh, expensive technology for, for a, um, a AR, VR video. Um, but you can also just use the, the $15 Google Cardboard, as, as we see in the picture here, uh, and get a really immersive experience. And what's really exciting about this content is it comes as part of ProQuest One Academic. It comes in a standard addition to Avon. And we started with about 40 odd videos across a variety of topics um, that really help make that learning experience very immersive. And we know that we're still learning ourselves on what kind of content is being used in the classroom, what kind of uh, video 360 um, content is, is a, appropriate for a classroom. So we started with not only the kind of scientific topics, um, but really, you know, using it to send students into an Egyptian pyramid, send students into the day in the life of a Pakistani hospital worker, or, um, you know, sending them onto the moon to be able to, to interact and, and to walk around. These types of videos really are, are changing the way that we're seeing teaching happen and allowing the students to have a much more personal connection with the content. Um, and that really is very exciting time to, to, to watch. Uh, and we're looking for lots of feedback on what kind of video your libraries are looking to add and you're hearing from your faculty are important to, to be added to the curriculum. So we're really proud that the Progress One Academic is, is sort of changing the way that institutions are, are looking at co collection development. Um, this is an institution in Australia and they're looking at Procus One Academic as really a single source to access content across all of their major disciplines. So again, playing to that multidisciplinary strength um, at Christian Heritage College and similarly at Liverpool John Moores University here in the UK, um, they really see the benefit to their community of providing the, that wealth of high quality variety of, of formats across journals, ebooks, videos, dissertations, and news. Um, this is going to be a really important stepping stone for them to, to provide content materials to their, their community um, that can help push them forward into their uh, own teaching and, and research and learning goals. So that's great. <laughs> so we've done a lot of work. Um, luckily, uh, the response has been very positive and we are continuing to get feedback from universities as we're talking through the process. Um, and so it's really exciting, but of course, this work is never done. Um, and so as soon as we launched in January, we got our heads back together and said, okay, we did this research last year with the faculty and the students. Do the librarians agree? So we did some research at the beginning of the year, uh, back in the March, April timeframe to ask the same types of questions that we had asked the faculty and students. And we wanted to understand if the librarian challenges were the same and if their interpretation of the needs uh, were the same. And one of the key things that came out of this was that, yes, indeed, a multidisciplinary database that worked across all the formats was important to their researchers. Uh, over 65% uh, agreed to that statement. So that's good. That was a good validation, again, that Procos One Academic is going to provide value to the institutions. Um, but interestingly, they also said that discipline-specific databases continue to be important. And so this is kind of where the research slightly turned uh, and we started to look externally again at, at what this could mean for, for ProQuest trying to solve the, the problems for, for researchers and, and students. And we tried to understand if offering both multidisciplinary and discipline specific databases could actually coexist. Um, you know, we see trends towards generalization in, in many areas. 
um, and certainly in many uh, user experiences, are really looking very, very broadly. But again and again, we've heard from you and, and your counterparts that you know, it's really important to have that specialization. It's really important to provide that, um, that disciplinary lens that's really unique to, to particular faculty. Unfortunately, or, or fortunately perhaps, um, in addition to saying that you, you wanted both multidisciplinary, uh, multi-format, and discipline-specific multi-format, it would certainly make life a lot easier if they were all accessible from a single resource. So unifying that content and, and providing that simplified administration was also really critical. So I had to stop and ask myself as a product manager if this was even possible. Could we do both wide and deep at the same time on the same platform and provide um, answers to the, all of those different researchers? Um, was there a difference uh, between uh, it being an undergraduate needing the generous resource and perhaps only the postdocs need the specialty resources. And really trying to understand, you know, at what point do you need which resources? And so that's what we kind of set the most recent research off, trying to understand. And luckily we went back to uh, the father of thought, you know, Albert Einstein, and he said all re religions, arts, and sciences are branches from the same tree. So even though there is disciplinary difference and distinction, they all come from the same source. So that seemed to kind of be a good starting point to understand that perhaps they could all coexist, both that, that breadth and depth at the same time. And then we looked a little bit further and, and found some interesting research on what the expectation is for, for students after graduation, whether they go on to a career in academia or into the private or public sector, you know, is education actually providing the skills that are necessary? And this report from the National Academy of Sciences said, actually, that the narrow, narrow disciplinary education route that we're seeing is preventing the development of critical lifelong learning skills. And if we think back to that point uh, of the faculty saying, you know, with 96% agreement, that the importance of accessing interdisciplinary research and, and accessing research across a variety of top, uh, formats is really about building those critical thinking skills and allowing students to draw their own conclusions. So unfortunately, the trend towards narrow disciplinary education is actually reducing our ability to graduate students that have those critical lifelong learning skills. So this is quite a, a, a dilemma and certainly an opportunity to, to intervene and say, okay, we do need narrowing uh, discipline education, but perhaps we also need to to counteract that, that narrowing with a, a generalist education as well. And another uh, report that came out of a book called T-shaped professionals, and if you haven't read about T-shaped people or T-shaped professionals, it's a very interesting topic. And it's really saying that um, to succeed in the future, we need to create a society that's built up of T-shaped people. And T-shaped people have both a single uh, aspect of themselves that, that's quite deep. They have a, a specialization across a certain area, uh, but they can go broadly across a variety of, of topics. Um, and that, that allows them to work more fluidly with other uh, folks in jobs and research, et cetera. And one of the most interesting quotes that came out of this, this book to me was that, you know, we've moved away from information era where knowledge is the main capital to a thinking econ economy where integration, innovation, and unstructured collaborative problem solving are key skills. So again, this is really coming back to the, the skills that are gonna be necessary for the next generation of problem solvers and being able to work fluidly with other specialists and to integrate and to, to innovate with other specialists. That requires that interdisciplinary skill and that unstructured way of thinking. And so naturally there is actually a, a coexistence between these two. So then we thought, okay, where do we see examples of researchers alternating between that breadth and depth? Does this happen only in STM? Because that's, that's often the, the first idea of this large scale research projects. One great example recently would be the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, the work that Katie Bauman did as a computer scientist working for the first time ever with astronomers. You know, she was working on an interdisciplinary team and she really believes that it was the interdisciplinary expertise of bringing different types of people and different types of thinkers together that allowed them to, to, to create something that was once thought impossible. Um, this is a quote from uh, about 18 months ago at a TED talk that she did. 
and certainly in May of this year, uh, this great video, uh, image went viral uh, of them with the first image of a black hole. Uh, and so that's really thanks to interdisciplinarians connecting disciplinary specialists. But it's not just science, technology, and medicine that are benefiting from a combination of breadth and depth, a combination of generalists working together with specialists. We also see it in the social sciences and the arts and humanities. Um, and this is a fantastic project that's worth doing a little bit of research on if you've got some time. Uh, Mary Beth Heffman is a professor and artist at Occidental College, and she works as, in arts. And a couple of years ago during the Ebola crisis, she, she was really touched by the, the sadness or the, the loneliness that patients might feel if they weren't seeing their caretakers, their, their medical specialists face every day. And she thought about what an isolating experience it was and how you know, such a simple solution as putting the health workers um, photograph on the cover of their suit would give that more personal experience. And, and she was so frustrated that no one was making this change. And she realized that it was really only her view and her background in the arts and humanities and social sciences that allowed her to come up with this, this very small innovation that was really a huge change to the way that people were interacting in, in the healthcare profession and that they were reacting to the, the Ebola crisis. So a very beautiful story um, and really shows what happens when we can combine the best of all of these different specializations across these large scale projects and, and kind of global uh, problems that we all face. So um, definitely room for, for generalists to work with specialists across all the fields. And certainly there's definitely space to do that within a single uh, single product. So, so what's next for ProQuest? Uh, so I'm going into my last two slides here and then I, I'd be happy to take some questions. I see some have come in. Um, well, we did address the, the request for a multidisciplinary, multi-format database uh, on a unified platform through ProQuest One Academic. And, and we are seeing that that's really been helping researchers cross-search all of the content that ProQuest can offer um, and get access to it and move very swiftly through the different stages of a research cycle. Um, and naturally, we are now <laughs> starting to explore uh, how to address the, the needs of those specialist deep dives. Um, what are the unique functionalities and the unique content sets that are required for, for scholars and scholars in different areas, for students in different disciplines? Uh, so we're really excited that we'll be looking to launch new uh, discipline-based solutions that offer that, that rich discipline-specific user experience that will allow uh, those specialists to explore and access unique specialist content. Um, and when they get to that point in their research where they actually need to look a bit laterally uh, because they come across terminology that's from outside their field, then they can look broadly again. And we really see that it's an oscillation between generalists and specialists actually in the course of an hour, in the course of a day, um, let alone at the large scale of some of these projects. So really exciting time ahead. And if you do have any uh, feedback on that and, and want to talk to us either today or another time, um, we're definitely looking for some feedback on, on how to, to cater to, to both the, the generalist and specialist experience. So with that, I will turn it over to Justin to uh, field the Q&A. Thanks, Bree. We did get a, a few questions in over chat. Um, the first one uh, is, is the, how does this product work with discovery systems and does it, is it intended to replace your discovery service? So it works with and it is not intended to replace at all. Um, obviously, we have a great in-house knowledge on making fantastic best-in-class discovery solutions with our, our brothers and sisters over at Ex Libris. Um, and we really think of it as um, making the best possible experience at the content uh, layer, at being able to make the best possible experience interacting with the content. Um, and we know that you know there's so many more resources that go beyond the ProQuest Space that you want to provide access to, um, and that you subscribe to, or or have in your own personal, um, your own institutional collections. So this would never uh, replace the the discovery experience, um, but it certainly works really well because we have such a close relationship with our colleagues in uh, the discovery teams. Okay, um, and then did. Um... 
We got some questions on the uh, the uh, student and faculty um, survey. So looking for a link to the results from from that particular survey, which um, we'd be more than happy to to share as as part of the uh, follow up uh, to this to this webinar. But yes, yeah, there's some specific questions on. Uh, the, the breakdown of the students and faculty who took, who took the survey um, and uh, how, how long the survey was con conducted, that, those types of questions, which is all part of the, the research report, which we'd be more than happy to, to share after, after the um, webinar. Um, yeah, I think, I think that the survey was open for about six weeks and um, it was tended to, towards um, there were more faculty than students, but, but as, as Mark, um, Justin said, there's a, a fair breakdown in the report, so we'll make sure everyone gets a link to that and you can, you can dig into the details and come back with any other questions. Great. Um, and we had another question um, on, is there any functionality within ProQuest One Academic that is not in the ProQuest platform? No, so that's that's an important uh, point that ProQuest One Academic uh, is a is a collection on the ProQuest platform um, that comprises all of the different formats. So you get the richest possible experience by having access to those different content formats. But the the functionality really is on the ProQuest platform itself. So if you have a different collection uh, that combines books and newspapers and journals, you're still going to benefit from that cross searching. Um, but certainly the more content, obviously, the, the more depth that, that your students and faculty can go into. And uh, there was another question here on subject specific, on plans for creation of subject specific collections. Mm -hmm. So at ALA annual uh, this year, uh, we announced, was that about a month ago? Uh, we announced kind of a, a behind the scenes that this later this fall we'll be launching ProQuest One Literature. Um, so that's a really exciting first step. Uh, we've been doing a lot of research for the last year, uh, actually probably last year and a half, um, working with an advisory board, trying to understand the, the unique content types that are uh, important to literary scholars, trying to understand how to organize and structure the information in a way that goes beyond the simple search and retrieve experience. Um, so that's, that's something that we'll be launching later this year, um, and it's really our first kind of foray into this discipline-specific experience. Um, so if you do have any feedback on, on literature, but would love to have you get in touch with us, and I'll put you in touch with that product manager. Um, but we're, we're starting to explore other disciplines as well, and, and those teams have been working for the last couple of months, um, so there'll be more to come next year as well. Um. Then we had a, a follow-up to uh, the discovery service question on, on how it interacts with, with a product uh, like Primo or Summon, or a question so on, on how one academic. Yeah, sure. So it acts like other collections that you, you might have through ProQuest or other providers. Um, so it's indexed. Uh, we work with the Exlibris team, um, and it would be similar for, for other providers um, to make sure that the content is indexed appropriately. Um, and that the relevancy ranking is then managed on the discovery side, um, and then they would come to uh, the the links would point to the ProQuest platform to actually interact with that piece of content, be it a video, a journal article, et cetera. I hope that answers the question a bit better. Okay. Then a, a few more um, on invoicing for the products in ProQuest One. Uh, are they subscribed, are they negotiated and subscribed to on, on one invoice? Yeah, that's a, that was a big part of trying to simplify the administration, um, uh, reducing the number of platforms, but also reducing the churn in, in the contract process. We know that it takes up a lot of time and there's a lot of committees uh, and there's a lot of process that goes through the procurement. So we're really trying to streamline that by helping you align the, the contract into a single uh, point in time, we also understand that that doesn't work for every institution and that actually might cause more headaches. Um, so there are certainly other ways to, to go about it, um, but we do think that it should help reduce some of the administrative burden by moving to a streamlined single license. 
Uh, we, so a question here on, on uh, including act, provide search access to selected open information, such as open access journals and government documents and perhaps TED Talks. So we do have we a consider. collection uh, within the ProQuest platform that if you are, if you subscribe to anything on the ProQuest platform, uh, you can ask your account manager to set up access to the PAC database, which stands for publicly available content. Um, and this will give you uh, complementary access to all of the open access content that's on the ProQuest platform. So we've gone through and, and thrice checked all of the rights to make sure that this content is uh, content that has been requested to be open access. And so that will be, uh, it's available as its own collection that's, that, again, is complementary or free uh, if you have access to the ProQuest platform. So uh, feel free to get in touch with your account manager to request that. Um, TED Talks, I, I don't think we have any licensing agreements in plan for that, um, but certainly we're always looking for new video content, um, so that's the type of thing that we would be looking to, to augment the academic video um, with. We have our own version of uh, um, different, uh, different publishers that we work with, um, but that, that group is not one at this time. Then another uh, question here on, do we um, have any uh, visions kind of to, to uh, design resources kind of going beyond the um, Google search box? So do you understand? Homepage, the... I think so. So at, the, at this point, in that, you know, the, the homepage is really the friendliest, easiest way to search the ProQuest databases. Um, but we do already have an advanced search field, which allows for a more rigorous, more specialized searching. So that's already standard on the ProQuest platform. Um, but we do, our usage kind of analysis indicates that users prefer, or at least um, most students prefer, to start with a broad search and refine using filters. That's a behavior that they're, they're comfortable with. And we also hear feedback from um, graduate students and faculty that, you know, they need to be very comprehensive, so they have to run lots of different types of searches. So we still cater to command line searching if that's your thing, um, but certainly having that advanced search so that they can stay up to date. Um, we know that literature reviews are a really stressful part of uh, the life of a graduate student, um, so we, we do make sure that we can cater to both ends of the spectrum. Um, and then going forward, as I mentioned, with the progress on literature, we're looking at moving beyond just the search experience and finding different ways to interact with the content and different ways to structure the content that provides for more lateral movement. Um, and I'd be happy to, to, again, put you in touch with uh, the pro product manager on that one um, to show you some of the designs that we, we've got planned um, that will really make for a kind of a more organic discovery experience that's based around the way that literary scholars look at research, and that's either it's either author-based or it's work-based or it's movement-based. And so the content is structured in a different way as opposed to just search for F. Scott Fitzgerald and then show me everything that's in the database. So um, that kind of shotgun approach doesn't, doesn't necessarily work if you're uh, in, in that specialist kind of mindset. So, so we're looking to cater to, to both ends of the spectrum. And uh, so a few, a few other questions here. How, do, how does ProQuest deal with presenting relevant content when a user is searching uh, such a huge volume of content. That's a very good question. Uh, I mean, it's it's a question that that <laughs> that every company working on search is is constantly trying to tune uh, the relevancy ranking. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into it. You know, where the frequency, obviously, that the term is um, located, the the whether it's in the abstract or the full text. Um, so there's, there's many factors that, that influence the relevancy ranking. Um, what we do try to do as well is to showcase some of the content formats that might get lost, um, book chapters and videos. Uh, there's certainly less of them compared to some of the other types of uh, content. So we try to make sure that it's very clear um, that those can be filtered or can be found as well because they, they can tend to get drowned out by journal articles. Uh, or newspaper articles, just because there's a, a higher volume there. So constantly working on the on tuning the the relevancy ranking, um, but also allowing the end user to to tweak the sorting themselves and to do some filtering 
to get down to, to a sweet spot of results that they can actually work through. Um, so that's, yeah, that's an, a never ending, <laughs> a never ending story. Okay. Um, oh, cool. We have, so a question on the VR uh, content in uh, mm -hmm. academic video online. Uh, so it's the question is what's the name of the collection, but I, it's, I think we just have a selection of publishers in there. Uh, right. Yeah, so, so um, yeah. So it's yeah. It's part of Avon itself. So um, that's that's where the content lives. And because Avon is part of Focus on Academic, that that content also lives within PQ One A, as we sometimes call it. So um, it's not a separate collection. We're just constantly trying to make Academic Video Online a better product and a a, a more interesting product. And so we're constantly adding additional content as we're working with uh, different uh, video publishers. Uh, and so that newest content is is a combination of I think a couple of independent filmmakers and a couple of other things. But um, certainly, there's lots of information on our website about uh, the, the videos that we're starting to explore. Okay. Um, so, so some dis additional um, discovery questions, Bree. Uh, can can one get to the platform to the ProQuest platform uh, even if uh, if one does not have all four content types? Absolutely. I mean, the, the ProQuest platform is where, where all the content lives. So if you have any collection or any database on the ProQuest platform, you'll get to interact with a lot of this function with, with the functionality. Um, the, the value as we see it to, to libraries is that the more formats you have, the more sticky the experience can be for users. Um, and also that it allows them to move quite seamlessly through uh, the different stages again, going from a book chapter and then looking at a newspaper article and then a journal article without having to bounce around to lots of different resources. Um, but certainly they all live on the focus platform, so it can be as, as small or as large as you want. Okay, let's see here. On a, on a search um, such as, like the one you showed on food sustainability, does ProQuest prioritize results featuring that exact phrasing over those which simply feature the, the two words together or separately? So, yeah, like so, um, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm not the search pro, but I can certainly put you in touch with them. Um, but they're obviously, we, we follow a lot of the kind of historical um, uh, best practice of if it's in quotes, obviously that's that it's exact phrase searching. Um, but it, we are searching both those terms across the entire document, uh, in which case it's a full text available. It's a, the entire full text, and so we're looking for a frequency of terms. Um, but there shouldn't be a difference between which term is first and second. There's not a weighting that way, as far as I know. Okay. Um, I think that those are all the questions I see. So. All right, this is Mark from, from ACRL in Choice. I'll jump in and say um, we do have a little time, so if you get, want to sneak one question in under, under the wire, um, feel free to do so. But if um, we've gotten to all of them, then... Um, but, Mark, we did have yeah. one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, so we do have a uh, we have a question here on does ProQuest one work with uh, EBSCO Discovery Service? And uh, so, so the answer to that question is, um, it, you know, it's the data course is not uh, necessarily shared between um, ProQuest platform and and EDS, but they're there are some, uh, you know, strategies that that we that we suggest that, that uh, libraries with EDS who have uh, ProQuest products can can use to uh, improve the um, uh, discovery of of ProQuest of their ProQuest content in their library. So, um, you know, uh, you know, for example, you know, it's you know making sure that your ProQuest content is displayed prominently um, in in libguides, uh, for example. Or you know is, is like is kind of cent is in a central place uh, on your library website so that uh, you know faculty and students uh, when they come to your website have a can are able to you know be aware that you actually that you have these um, ProQuest resources. There is a a um, 
connector that that is available on on um, EDS that you can use, that you can set up uh, to access uh, call ProQuest um, platform content. Um, I'm not uh, you, you know I. I I know it's it's available and 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 it works. It's a um, it, it's a little bit of it's a difficult um, for users to actually uh, uh, discover that content sometimes or discover that the, those results sometimes. Um, but feel free to uh, you know send additional questions and we'd be happy to um, provide more suggestions on on that. Let me just check one more. I think we may have another quest, few questions come in. Um, So the, of course, there's a question on will the slides be shared, and, and yes, we will be sharing these slides uh, with with uh, with you after after the webinar. Um, I just would would add to that, you know, if you if you want to have a separate conversation about any of this stuff, or if you want to take a look at the reading, I'm I'm a dork, and I <laughs> welcome the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or to have a chat with your library about some of the stuff that we're seeing. So. Um, please don't be shy. My my email address is on there for for good reason. You know, Bree, can you just give a little bit more clarity on the distinction of, you know, the benefits of, you know, the the, the search experience, um, you know, we've designed on on uh, with ProQuest One Academic over a over a discovery service. You know, I, you know, we know. I know you've you've shared kind of some of your your um, you, you shared this. But you just reinforce some of those those um, you know the benefits of of being able to search. You know, a kind of a condensed set of uh, of content in a in a single research experience. I think that that's kind of a little bit more clarity is um, sure, I needed guess, there. I guess the thing is, um, you know, not every institution has a discovery solution, so that's that's part of the, the challenge that we face when we're presenting the content. Um, so we, we really aim for that simplicity. Um, and we also recognize the fact that, you know, if someone finds a resource that they like, they tend to stick with it, they tend to want to use it again and again, and that's good for us because we, we really want you to have a great experience. So we need to make sure the search is as, you know, as robust as it needs to be or as simple as it needs to be. Um, that being said, we also know that many of our customers have discovery solutions from uh, from Ex Libris or from other organizations, and so we make sure that we can work really well with that broader search experience as well. So the content has to be indexed in a, an appropriate way that works really well within um, your discovery solution alongside your other library resources. So it's really, you know, that, that pro the Discovery provides an extra layer of, of value in the search and provides the ability to go across all of the resources. What we try to do is just make sure that when you're searching, once you get to the ProQuest platform, that you're having that best experience interacting with the content, and you're also able to move very fluidly across the different content types. Because the content is, is within our database, we can look for patterns to, to recommend related information, to send users suggestions for other types of content that might be relevant that they wouldn't have found necessarily with a search, but because of you know serendipity and because of uh, usage patterns, we can say this might also be interesting. So that kind of lateral search experience is something that we're able to offer because the content is on the ProQuest platform, um, but we also recognize, again, that it's it's one of many resources and one of many platforms that you will send your users to. So we're trying to just make sure that for the volume of content that we've aggregated, that there's a very smooth and consistent experience. Any better, Justin? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> I, <hope so. laughs> um, I think uh, I, well, that, that those are all the questions I see, and I really love the, the dialogue, and so it's great to see all this interaction. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I just would second that. I really appreciate everyone's time today. Um, hope it was worthwhile for you. If you do have any feedback or uh, questions, please do get in touch with, with us. Um, we'd be happy to have more conversations. Excellent. And uh, again, this is Mark from ACRL and Choice. I would just say thank you to, to you, Bree, and to you, Justin, for taking the time to, to present all of this information today. Um, we, we really appreciate it. And I just would remind all the folks that are still out there um, that we did record the program today. So be on the lookout for that follow-up email um, with a link to the recording and the slides and all of that stuff. Um, and you should see a link uh, to a brief six-question survey um, to, uh, that we would very much appreciate if you took um, so that you can give us a little feedback on today's presentation and how everything went. Um, so look for that in your chat box and I'll send it through one more time so that if you're having trouble, it's right there for you. Um, so yeah, as, as has been said, thanks to everyone out there for joining us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session and I hope the rest of your day is great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.